Hello, bonjour, dzień dobry. My name is Jim Donaghy. This presentation is for the 32nd workshop of the Council of Europe's FER Eurethno Group on Imaginaries of Time, Time of Imaginaries, hosted by the University of Łódź on 12th of June 2020, but held online. As the title suggests, I will discuss various punk imaginaries of time, thinking especially about nostalgia or retromania, and iconoclasm, a sketch, an outline of these punk conceptions of time before taking a look at some examples from punk in Northern Ireland. I will conclude that punk imaginaries are primarily lived imaginaries situated in the here and now rather than something future or past oriented. I'll point towards some ideas around punk imaginaries of time as a kind of anti-history and an anti-future uh, that perhaps we can open up further in discussion after the presentation. The musical and cultural lineages that influence punk's aesthetic have been well noted. Especially important are the garage rock scene in the US and the pub rock scene in the UK. But various countercultures and music genres have been drawn upon to assemble punk. And punk's own influence on other scenes and genres continues to be substantial. However, despite this clear connection to predecessors, early punk understood itself as a year zero. This iconoclasm was famously directed at bloated prog rock dinosaurs, but this scorched earth attitude to anything that came before was aimed at numerous targets. To take some quick examples, The Clash targeted rock forebears in Elvis, The Beatles and The Rolling Stones, The Deadbeats wanted to kill hippies, and Razor wanted to stamp out disco. So the early punk conception of the past is clear enough, at least in its rhetorical year zero posturing, but the future is also a key concern. No Future is probably one of the most famous lyrical utterances from the early punk period, and this nihilistic tone is often associated with mainstream interpretations of punk. However, there were examples of a more positive view of the future in early punk. Penny Rambo from anarcho-punk progenitors Crass rejected the No Future of the Sex Pistols and understood punk as a do-it-yourself statement. As Rambo puts it, your own band, your own sound, your own words, your own attitude and your own future. Alan Ravenstein of post-punk pioneers Perry Boo is quoted as saying, The Sex Pistols sang no future, but there is a future and we are trying to build one. To bring in our focus on Northern Ireland here, Stiff Little Fingers also shared this hopeful vision of building a future in their anthem, Alternative Ulster. So punk conceptions of time are already revealed as being complex. We have an iconoclastic Year Zero attitude, despite the clear musical and subcultural influences of previous scenes, and the famous nihilism of No Future is directly challenged by other punks who hold a transformative vision of the future. This presentation has been retrospective so far in terms of identifying key conceptions of time, particularly in the early punk of the 1970s, but hopefully we can avoid nostalgia, and punk nostalgia is big business. The punk nostalgia industry really got into gear in the mid-1990s. In the UK, 1996 was a key year, being the 20-year anniversary of the appearance of the punk scene in London and the first punk singles released in the UK in late 1976. The Sex Pistols cashed in, of course, with the Filthy Lucre International Tour. The pointedly nostalgic Holidays in the Sun Festival also started in Blackpool in the same year. And this festival actually is still running now uh, as Rebellion, but it's greatly improved and now includes a lot more contemporary bands. But from this uh, poster from 1996, you can see the prominence of all these, these old band names, especially from the 1970s. This nostalgia industry was clearly focused on old punks, now a bit older with a bit more expendable income, but it also coincided with the emergence of a wave of commercial pop-punk bands from the US, uh, particularly those on major labels such as Bad Religion, and especially Green Day. So the punk nostalgia industry also had an eye towards this new punk fan cohort. Punk nostalgia was expressed in literature throughout the 1990s as well, with a heap of biographies and autobiographies. To give just a small selection, in 1991 we have John Savage's book on the Sex Pistols, in 92 Legs McNeil from Punk Zine in uh, New York, has a history of the 70s scene there, Griel Margus collects his journalistic writing on punk in 93, uh, Johnny Rotten's autobiographies in 94, and then more autobiographies from Henry Rollins of Black Flag and Penny Ramble from Crass. There are many, many more. Academic work on punk as history also started emerging in the 1990s. There had been previous work with a more uh, contemporary attitude 
from the likes of Dick Hebdige and, and Dave Lang, of course. Um, some of the examples from the 1990s, uh, and these are actually quite good books, are Stuart Holmes' Cranked Up Really High and the edited collection by Roger Sabin, Punk Rock So What? There is a wide measure of variation across all these perspectives on punk, certainly. But the problematic outcome of all of them is the calcification of punk as a moment, a historical moment, neatly packaged, eulogised and firmly dead. Andy Medhurst correctly identifies this nostalgia or retromania as a betrayal of punk's ethos. It really is the opposite of the iconoclasm that we've already identified as a key punk attitude. However, the reverential attitude towards early punk icons was already being challenged in the late 1970s. Penny Rambo of Crass makes this point perfectly, lumping the Clash and the Sex Pistols in with the rock dinosaurs of the Beatles, Bowie and the Stones. The cover of the 1980 split single with Poison Girls actually deterns the Sex Pistols. Uh, this is artwork by G. Voucher from Crass. And she replaces the Sex Pistols' heads with key political figures such as the Queen, the Pope, and the Statue of Liberty and Maggie Thatcher. And Ian Glasper writes that Crass were a year zero. Another year zero, a new year zero. So despite the nostalgia industry that has grown around punk since the 1990s, this is clearly identified as a problem. And even by the end of the 1970s, punk's iconoclasm is being directed back at punk itself. This is assuredly anti-nostalgic. And this anti-nostalgic attitude continues in punk today, as we'll discuss a bit later in the case of Northern Ireland. But let's take a look now at punk nostalgia in Northern Ireland. The Northern Irish punk scene has been a particularly vibrant one, over the last 43 years, but it has not been immune to the nostalgia industry. Some key moments in this Northern Irish punk nostalgia include the publication of O'Neill and Trelford's book It Makes You Want to Spit in 2003. It's quite a good book, but the idea of presenting a definitive guide that ends in 1982 clearly plays into the idea of punk as history. Punk as a dead, calcified moment. The punk supergroup, Shame Academy, formed in the same year. They played their first gig at the book launch, where It Makes You Want to Spit, actually. The band features members of Rudy, The Outcasts and Stalic 17 and they only play old punk covers and it's so nostalgic it hurts. The punk mannequin in a glass coffin appeared at the Oh Yes Centre in Belfast in around 2007. It's actually some clothes from Greg Cowan from The Outcasts and it's been part of a permanent display at the Ulster Museum since 2018. It's actually the first thing you see as a visitor to the museum uh, in a, an exhibition about the Troubles, but it's essentially the same as the sarcophagus upstairs. This is mummified punk. The story of Terry Hooley and the Good Vibrations record label and shop in Belfast, which released uh, bands like The Undertones and other seminal bands, has been eulogised in a film in 2012 and has even become a stage show at the Lyric Theatre in 2018. There's also been some academic nostalgia for punk in Northern Ireland, primarily uh, McLoon's 2004 article, which looks explicitly at alternative punk imaginaries of that early period, but this falls firmly into the punk as history trap. It's notable that this academic article came out just after this tide of punk nostalgia that I identified from 2003, so I think there's a clear link there. But, of course, this nostalgia has been opposed by the actually existing and not dead punk scene in Belfast and in Northern Ireland more widely. Pink Turds in Space were early to the anti-nostalgia theme with their cover of the undertones pop punk hit Teenage Kicks and they reimagined it as a screamed thrash punk blast. Billy Riot and the Violent Fuckwits sing If You Used To Be A Punk Just Fuck Off And Die and note the year on this, 2004, so this is a pointed attack on the likes of Shame Academy. And in 2014 the Warzone Collective hosted Fuck Nostalgia Fest. The social media advertising included No Pogo as a condition of entry, referring to the old school punk dance style. And at the gig, a piñata of Terry Hooley was smashed to pieces. And Terry Hooley is the proprietor of Good Vibration Shop and Label that has been vaunted in the film and stage show just mentioned. And it is notable that the video footage of the Terry Hooley piñata being smashed actually had to be removed from the internet after a backlash from some of the Northern Irish punk nostalgists who thought that this was a kind of sacrilege against the icon of Terry Hooley. And the same happened for Crass when they insulted the Sex Pistols in 1980 with that single cover. They received abuse for defiling the sacred Sex Pistols and in 2014 when anarchist punks defiled Terry Hooley they also receive abuse and it's, it's in the same vein. So this conflict between nostalgia and iconoclasm is a persisting one. So what can we say about this conflicting collection of punk imaginaries of time? The rejection of nostalgia is healthy. 
punk has sustained itself as an international movement for more than 40 years because it can reinvent itself across time and space. That rich lineage of punk's history is there as a resource to learn from and adapt. It's not an historical movement to slavishly eulogise. As the Irish comedian Darrow Brain put it, nostalgia is heroin for old people. And this is the case with punk nostalgia. It appeals to those who have lost contact with the lived experience of the punk movement. As Andy Medhurst writes, punk is about the here and now, and now is no longer 1977. I don't think it's wrong to celebrate punk's vibrant past, and people are clearly still moved by the personal influence that punk had on their lives back in the day, whenever their day was, and that is a subjective category. But the nostalgia industry strangles the continuing and very much alive punk scene by appealing to a past moment as the one true punk experience. I discussed the future looking conceptions of time in punk, we had no future and the hopeful transformative imaginaries and I pointed to dystopia. There's a lot more to say on punk dystopia, I think this is the strongest thread of future orientation in punk but it's typically used as a critique of the present. To give just one example from Northern Ireland, uh, this is a poster from the 2009 album by Thousand Drunken Nights displaying a dystopian vision of the Belfast punk experience. There's a lot in here, far more than I can uh, describe in the limited time here, but I do write about it a little bit more in a forthcoming chapter. Uh, you can email me to ask for a copy of that. On No Future, Sean Albiez is critical of this idea of no futurism because he argues that it prematurely curtails utopian thinking and creativity, the outcome of which he argues is atrophy. But, as we've said, punk is about the here and now, not the future, and I don't think this entails atrophy at all. The key point is that punk is about a lived experience. Even punk nostalgia is at least a memory of someone's lived experience. This emphasis on the here and now of doing and being punk chimes with DIY ethics and especially with anarchist political philosophy. And of course, punk more widely is heavily influenced by anarchist political philosophy and punk is an embodiment of do-it-yourself ethics. So it's not about a utopian imaginary of a punk future. It's a rejection of the nostalgic imaginary of a punk past. The punk scene is animated and sustained by a lived imaginary of the here and now. And while I don't have the time to expand these points now, perhaps we can think about this as a kind of anti-history or anti-future. And that's it. Thank you, merci beaucoup and jikuye. I look forward to your questions and comments and feel free to contact me at the email address on screen.